Um, I'm, as I said, Eric Schmiglow uh, from Hive Technologies. We're a data consultancy. And we're going to talk to about today about something that's slightly less technical than the other talks that we've heard today, uh, more focused on how, how actually businesses can incorporate machine learning and AI technologies into their businesses, because that's one big challenge that a lot of companies face uh, today. So in order to get stating maybe a little bit of obvious things, I'm going to recap where we stand, move forward to uh, how to get started and how to set up and then uh, go through uh, methods of implementation and how you actually do stuff in your own company. Like, where do we stand with machine learning? It's, machine learning and AI is all the rage today. Everywhere, it pops everywhere. In your phone, in self-driving cars, automated systems, robots that carry stuff, and obviously the big event of this year, AlphaGo. Well, the first time that actually uh, a system could manage to beat a human being at the very complex game of Go. Uh, what does that actually, where does that come from? Like the large companies, large data inc incumbents, Google, uh, Facebook, AWS, and all them, have invested enormous resources in developing AI systems, while new businesses threaten old business models with data-driven approaches. Think Airbnb and the hotel industry. But where does that actually come from? Interestingly enough, the stuff that we're talking about, machine learning and AI and all that, is actually quite old. It's typical for uh, computer science that most of the concepts have been invented decades ago and are now coming to fruition. If we look at artificial intelligence, that's something that was dreamt of in the 1950s and then gradually refined in different systems and in, uh, in concepts and algorithms uh, and, and, and prototypes in research labs. Um, we, we have, we've been seeing uh, a lot of uh, presentations uh, in this, in the, on this, in this conference about machine learning and deep learning, so I'll just skim over, uh, over that because most of you actually know what it is. But the essential message is that we're looking and implementing, uh, implementing concepts and technologies that are actually quite old. But the, re the, qu the question is, if that's so old, why is it going through the roof nowadays, today? And that actually has more external factors and reasons than the technology itself. It's because, essentially, as of now, as we stand today, we have an abundance of data that allows us to deploy those techniques and technologies to actually work with them and having meaningful uh, outcomes, and it's extraordinarily cheap to do so. And the second thing is tooling. Now, we, we've been seeing a lot of presentations in the, at this conference and other conferences about different libraries, NumPy, uh, SparkML, TensorFlow, and all that. And for the first time in the long, uh, for, the, for the first time, we have an abundance of solutions and frameworks and approaches that we can use and bank on to build our tools. And that is basically the main differentiator between what we have today and what we used to have in the past. That being said, what we actually see is that Machine learning and, by extension, everything that has to do with uh, the buzzword artificial intelligence is essentially leaving the lab. So we're seeing real-world deployments of machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, and not just the kind of, well, we have this research lab at Microsoft Lab or at AT&T at, at, uh, AT Research developed a system that can recognize speech. No, we actually have that on our phones, we have that in our cars, we have that everywhere. And, and it's increasingly uh, marching into our daily lives. What that essentially also means is that, of course, research is still pushing the envelope and we're still getting benefiting from, from, more, from, from those developments and it basically goes mainstream, but it also means that uh, the many, many industries and areas are shaken by data-driven approaches. And we can see the space is also heating up because venture capital has discovered this topic as the next big thing and is investing a lot of money in uh, funding startups that are poised to disrupt industries and change the way we work and change the way we use products. 
So what we're actually seeing is if you're an existing company, maybe a company that was created 50 years or 100 years ago with mechanical products or services, stuff that was basically used before the digital age, there's a big storm coming up because people have tools and techniques and approaches that might threaten or challenge your business and the way you operate. And we're seeing that not only in the typical areas such as fintech and commerce and, and advertising and everything that is per se digital, we're seeing that in areas that are essentially non-digital like agriculture, energy, uh, supply, healthcare. We've seen healthcare uh, like in the previous presentation just a couple of minutes ago. And that means that we're basically experiencing an, a transformation of industries at an unprecedented level, basically something that's similar to uh, the introduction of the steam engine or mass chain production in the Industrial Revolution. That also means that early movers in their, specific, in their particular cases, in their spaces, in their individual areas, can have a competitive advantage against everyone else if they move fast. So now what? What does this mean? If you have like a company, well, how do you get actually started? And many people ask us, okay, uh, I know we have to do this. My CEO was at a conference and he heard that if we're not basically transit, uh, making the transition to a digital company, we're going to be dead in 10 years. Can you set up a Hadoop system for us? But that's actually not the answer, right? Hadoop is not magical dust, uh, uh, the fairy dust that transforms your company. If you don't have a strategy and an approach, it's not going to work. So what you actually need to implement change in your company, you need initial data sets, obviously. Huh? That's pretty clear. You need an organization that supports it. Creating just one detached department that does data science somewhere will not be the answer to your problems. You need a team that actually does it. And you need a product in which you can actually integrate it which is actually quite obvious, but those are the four necessary steps to industrialize data-driven approaches in existing companies. So, what does it actually mean? In order to get that running, you have to trigger the data flywheel. What does that mean? You basically, it's a recurrent process of ingesting data, working with it, creating better products, having more users, different users, new markets, feeding that data back, and in continuously in an endless movement, basically improve your offerings and fine-tune and, and, and widen the net of the stuff that you do. Essentially, how you actually get started is you have to identify a use case. What is your primary use case? What can you actually do? What is immediately connected to your existing business? Where can you actually collect data? Second is secure your data pipeline. Make sure that actually data gets into the system and you can actually work with it. Then re refine and redefine your products and understand your users and the people that actually drive your product within your organization. Those are the key factors to get started. You obviously also have a couple of challenges. Yeah? First of all, it's pretty clear as because it's a flywheel, you have to iterate multiple times. And it's not going to be a, an instant success. It's something that's going to work immediately out of the box. So you have to have the, the, the courage to, to face issues and to, to, to deep dive into the problem and repetitively retrain and reprocess the data until you get it right. Start for that, and you have to smart, start with small use cases that actually work and that you can control. And you also have to manage expectations. Because as I said earlier, if your C-level executive came on the scene and said, we need to do something, or otherwise we're going to be uh, dead in 10 years, his implicit expectation is that you basically create a magical system that does everything, and it works out of the box, and you're basically the king of the world. That's not going to happen. So you have to manage the expectation, and you have to explain that we're basically experimenting and, and slowly and gradually uh, getting into into the business uh, of, of data-driven uh, approaches. You have to also help users and management understand the issues that you will face and the challenges that you will face and the problems that you can actually tackle with machine learning approaches, and which you cannot, right? So, essentially, 
This involves four steps. First of all, data collection. That is key. If you can't control the data and you don't have an automated recurrent process that ingests this data into your system, it's not going to work. Then you have to have a process that measures and explores that data. Because necessarily, most companies have KPI monitoring systems that work perfectly well, but that's basically instant snapshots of what's happening. Data collection is more than that. So you need to explore the relationships that weren't known before. You need, need to explore the, the, the intricacies of your data sets, and you have to try to plot and understand what that actually means. And then obviously, once you have that, once you have that, when you're done with that exploration, you classify and train and try to, uh, to uh, apply predictions and models to your data sets, and essentially then apply those models to your business flow and your products. Okay, that is basically on an abstract level the four steps that you need to do. And what it actually entails means that you also have to have an organization that supports the process. So you have to identify your users, you have to integrate the data suppliers, you have to make sure that, uh, the, that levels, satisfaction levels are defined with existing sy systems and processes and how, what the inter integration actually entails. And you have to inform and win over uh, stakeholders in larger companies where you have multiple departments that all have their basic data ownership. They're not going to relinquish control unless you actually inform and you win them over and they actually see a benefit of being part of that process. And of course, that's also very important in our space, legal and privacy issues. We're going to see a massive expansion of regulatory measures in data privacy and, uh, and security. Uh, so we need to be sure that we have the right legal framework in place for exactly those things. In order to have the organizational firepower to do that, because that also Im implies talking to a lot of people and still focusing on the task at hand, you need to create a, a dedicated data team. I mean, that's pretty obvious for most of us in the, at this conference, but it's not exactly clear to everyone else in larger organizations because they basically, basically still have the habit of asking a vendor and having a vendor install software, and then it should run, right? But that doesn't work like that. So an effective data team actually has two different roles. All that is also obvious to you, I understand that, but let's just say, for the sake of, of, of being clear, we have two roles, and that's the data scientist, that's the math, PhD kind of statistics guy that, that has the capability of understanding data and exploring relationships in data. And then you have the engineers. And the data engineer is a role that is essentially a person with a software development background that understands the challenges of data and data processing and can build system and automate stuff that the data scientists come up with. Those two roles are extremely important to ensure success in a data team. Of course, everybody's dreaming of having the magical unicorn person that ha has both skills in one, but that's probably going to take a while until that happens. So until then, we're going to have to work with having two people with two different roles that actually work together. And at, at some point, they're going to meet in the middle. Setting up a team also needs, requires a few things, because as I said, it just doesn't work to have like, a department that is like, somewhere and is not integrated in the organization. Make sure that the other data suppliers relinquish ownership to the data team. They actually understand that it's vital for the process that these people have full access and continuous access to data records, and not just involving like, oh, we're going to update our quarterly reports to you guys, and we're going to put it on the FTP server as an CSV format, and you can download it from it. No, we want to have, we need a continuous flow of data. Super important. You need a data ingestion pipeline that works and supports that, because if you're not, you don't have a continuous data flow, um, it's never going to work. I ha we had an example of a company, a transportation company. They were trying to plot uh, the, uh, the um, arrival dates of their transport, uh, the, their, of their transportation means, and they were giving us data that was three months old. And we told them that, that just doesn't work like that. I mean, if we don't have actual, we need historical data, that's actually also important, but if we don't have current data, we can't plot anything. Three months old stuff is totally stale and has no value. 
Um, data science and data engineering, we talked about that. Explore, uh, data science has the task of exploring uh, relationships, and the data, science, data engineering is basically uh, for engineering automation processes. Lastly, once you have that, you actually want to focus on involving your products. And involving your products means that you have to hook the value chain, every bit of your value chain with the data team. Because that will give you support metrics and KPIs and data exchange between the data team and your value chain. That allows you to identify possible opportunities to improve a process, to streamline a process, or to reinvent additional services and, and, and solutions on top of your product and value chain. But it also gives you the, the ability to save money by identifying um, um, uh, like, uh, inefficient uh, processes or uh, aspects of the value chain and maybe replace them with automation. And essentially, what is also crucial is to engage the users and products uh, and, and, and engage your users into that process because only them only the users can actually ensure that whatever you do with your data approach will actually work. I'll give you an example. If we have a, 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 product, uh, a product that's based on planning, that has uh, uh, users that actually e uh, run estimates from their experience, and they basically plan stuff, and you install a system that basically helps them uh, uh, plan their stuff with predictions, if you don't engage them in the process to validate your predictions, they're not just not going to use it. They're going to continue doing the stuff that they've done until now, even though you have a fancy, shiny new prediction tool that's integrated in your, in your platform. So you have to make sure that you engage these people and that you profit from their experience and listen to their criticism and worries and, 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 and all that to make sure that you address it and you improve acceptance. Because without users, there's no product. Lastly, this opens a, a wide range of opportunities in, in many markets. You can validate your market assumptions on real metrics. Yeah. Until now, companies were basically planning products, doing like small range market tests by introducing a product in a small market that they thought they could control. Um, and hoping that everything, fingers crossed, everything would work. But now you can actually validate those market assumptions by simulating ma market responses. In many markets, that's really important. Like, for instance, in insurances, when you actually try to, to when you, you introduce a new insurance product, you can actually simulate the responses of markets, for instance. Or by introducing another digital product, you can do that by... Uh, uh, by running simulations on, on your historical data. You can react to new trends because by opening, widening the net, the net of data ingestion, for instance, listening to external factors on social media and, and, and on other, in other areas, advertising, uh, website visits and all that, you can actually react to changing patterns in users. That's especially important for commerce companies. Uh, e-commerce companies, identifying usage patterns and interests and trends is actually super important. And that's something that you can actually do with that. You can actually also roll out new product features based on predicted customer behavior, which is quite obvious, but that is, uh, that is the, the enormous potential of, of, of data-driven approaches. And you can accurately measure the individual product performance, but also the the, the, the factors, uh, other secondary support factors. Like in commerce, for instance, you usually have, um, if you look at the sales of different products, you'll see that one product goes through the roof, but others aren't sold well. But once you take them away, the, that has an effect on the sales of the top selling product. And that is something that people don't usually understand by just looking at the metrics that are reported by classical BI systems, but is something that you can understand using data-driven approaches, because that basically depicts the support factors and relationships between products, like the so-called upselling curve. So that's also important to understand that. And essentially, by providing a, a method and an approach that also helps you 
uh, improve and optimize your supply chain, you can provide cheaper and safer service services with greater customer value. So essentially, understanding and incorporating those, that approach into your existing model has enormous benefits, even if it isn't that easy to do. But by, uh, by sticking to the basic outline of what we've seen here in this presentation, that is actually a major factor for getting it right. And with that in place, the sky is li the limit for your company. Thank you very much. <laughs>